Hey everyone, welcome to Investing for Generational Wealth. I'm Keshav Kalor and I'm joined, actually not joined by my co-host John Lai today. We're from Clive Capital where we help high earners just like you invest outside of the stock market to passively achieve long-term wealth generation through superior risk-adjusted returns, long-term passive cash flow, and tax benefits. Together with our investors, we've helped them invest into over a thousand apartments and 500 single family homes so far. And before we begin, a quick disclaimer, we are not financial advisors. All investments are subject to risks, including the possible loss of the money you invest. So perform your due diligence before making any financial decisions. And of course, consult your CPA, your attorney, other professionals in your life before beginning your investments. Igor and I, we're not professionals. We just like to dress up and get on a podcast and chat. That's it. So today's episode <laughs> is discipline and determination in business and real estate. And today's guest is Igor Shaltanov. Correct. All right. All right. Welcome to the show, Igor. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Kishaw. It's a beautiful day. So I would love to share as much as I can. And, you know, let's start. Yeah, let's get right into it. If you could tell us about how you got started in your just your professional career, you know, just catch us up to how you got to where you are today. Oh, yeah, it's a long journey. It's a it's a beautiful and great journey for myself. And I enjoy every step of the way. And it started, if you imagine, 1990s in, in Moscow, Russia. And I grew up in a regular family. My mom was a doctor. And doctor in Russia, doctor in the United States, a different doctor. So, and uh, my dad was a police officer. And basically, it's a very, very usual family for everybody in the world, right? The doctor and police officer. And uh, the only way out, and we live in an apartment complex. Actually, there was like a... 100 plus units, right? And uh, one of the days, I'm maybe about 12 years old, and my friend is talking to me saying, listen, I'm going to pick up some cash from people. I was like, where are you going? Tell me. He's like, you know what? We rent an apartment for, you know, some people and they paying us some money. I was like, wow, what does that mean? So then just imagine I'm 12. It's uh, Russia, Moscow. There's no YouTube, no internet. There's no courses right to learn about real estate i was like wow that's fascinating and that idea just got stuck into my mind so probably about eight years later right i'm playing water polo i was a professional water polo player earning money and then my mom's saying to me listen we got spare apartment so we might leave there we might do something but i'll say oh you know what long time ago i heard the story about you can give it to people and they pay you money for that so, and I was maybe about 20 or 23 or so. And I said, mom, let me do this. I'm going to remodel this place. So we rent it to the people and you're going to move to the brand new apartment, which is just built and it's beautiful. And you guys absolutely deserve it. And that's exactly what we did. It took me about six months to convince my parents to move from, you know, old get used place and park next by and all the families and all the friends. Uh, to the brand new place, which is the, you know, uh, a lot better layout, right? Uh, uh, underground parking and stuff like that. Anyway, so I did it. I just fixed a little bit of my old apartment, rented to the people. And that's how my journey begins of earning passive, like a truly passive income because of one place. And it was not a lot of management. And the, the huge difference between uh, U.S. market and any other markets, I'm talking about the rush right now. And that was the management piece, right? If I rented something in Russia for, you know, a couple of years, maybe there's a couple of times when the people really call you or say something to you, right? Or complain about something, whether here, it just every single, if you own a single family house or, you know, single unit of something, right? For rent, the people are very demanding, especially in California, because I'm in California. So they're very demanding. They're asking for a lot. They want to change this, close the door, open this. I mean, that that was a huge management uh, lesson for me. So yeah, that was my first uh, 
ever uh, real estate investment. And besides that investment, I had some different investments like a stock market, the regular, I don't know, the cryptocurrency became very popular in 2017, 18 as well. So I I did some, um, uh, what I did as well, like a bond structure. Again, I, I hired the professional, which is the wealth management right uh, group. And then they were overseeing my caps, part of my capital. Uh, having that experience of real estate and the stock market and different alternative investments, I said, listen, you know what? After 10 years of testing different waters, so what was the most successful, I would say the, most, the safest investment, right? Which one performed consistently in real estate was winning by far. So, and then in Russia, 2000, uh, no, no, no. In in the United States, I'm going to move on to that. So, and and for me, it was you know what I need to really focus on something which is working, and I stop chasing the shiny objects all over the place and really focus on one thing, and became more sophisticated. So, back in Russia, right? I live there, so I I play water polo. My wife, we went to Turkey. I was participating in university games. It's like an Olympic Games, um, but for the people who is going to universities. And it was in Turkey, and I met my wife. She was playing professional basketball. So after that, um, we it was in Turkey. We moved back to Moscow, right? I said, "Listen, let's you know, let's let's get together. Let let's uh, form the family right together." And uh, that was the time when I stopped playing the water polo. And then she, you know, got pregnant and we were about to deliver a baby. And uh, her brother was drafted by a Clippers team in Los Angeles. And we were still living in Russia, in Moscow. And uh, I was working as assistant judge in court. That was a great experience as well for me. And uh, she said, you know what? I'm a little tired. We delivered a baby in the United States, actually. And then she came back to Moscow saying to me, you know what? It's your nine to five job is so demanding. So you're living at six in the morning and you're coming back at 9 p.m. And she said, if that's going to be the life for the next 20 years, like it's going to be like, you know, very tough, right? To sustain the couple. I right? might have missed this, like... but what was your nine to I might have missed this, but what was your nine to five? Yeah, I was assistant judge in court. Okay. Yes. I was like, a, yeah, working in the court system. And that was very, very demanding, like I said. So, and uh, when when she, when my wife came with a baby from the United States, because she delivered the baby in the United States, she said, you know what? Let's go take a look in the United States. Let's just have a little break. So you just stop your work, stop your job, stop, like quit your job, right? And we'll find something new right something more exciting and we came to los angeles and manhattan beach i don't know if you guys ever been there it's like a the beautiful city by the beach and when i landed there i saw beautiful people right in the flip-flops and shorts nobody's rushing you know everybody like enjoying the day and then they having the sun buff or they just swimming in the ocean and the kids are running around and everybody's smiling. I was like, wow, nobody told me you can actually live like that, right? You can do business and you can actually be um, um, very well balanced, right? On your life, um, on your day, right? On your, on your work day. And that was my dream. I said, listen, if people live like that, right? And you can replicate that and be happy. So that's what I want internally. And we had a ticket back to Russia, actually, because we had some plans to open a new business, right? And, you know, doing new endeavors with our future. And and at one dinner, my, not my, our manager, the family manager, she said, why are you guys coming back? And that struck us to the point when we said, listen, we have no, nothing to come back to, right? Why would we come back? So what we're going to do there? So we decided to stay. So we you know, I called my mom next day. I said, listen, mom, I'm not coming back. She was crying. But that was, a, a, you know, great opportunity for us and for our kids because we we're thinking through the lens of what's going to be the next generation, where they're going to be growing up, what's going to be the experience for them. And we decided to stay in the United States. And that was my huge decision. I think it was the changing point for my life because from that point on, so we started to build a new exciting right future for our family all together so i'll stop here occasionally
In fact, that's where it gets exciting, actually. Um, let me see. I guess, how was it leaving, you know, if we, if we could go more into leaving your friends and your family and kind of the world that you knew in Russia to come here in 2009, when you made that decision, like you were saying, you told your mom and called, walk us through what that decision was like. Was it a heavy one? Was it pretty clear cut? What were the things you were weighing? Because even if it's not as drastic as one continent to another continent, people, you know, here might move from one side of the country to another side of the country to pursue their dreams. And it might get lonely and stuff. Walk us through that part of your life. It's a great question. Yes. The, I mean, there's a couple of things. Number one, it was very comfortable to stay there, right? Because, you know, the culture, you know, the uh, rules, right? You know how to go by them, right? And uh, of course, your parents, you know, you feed every single day of your parents. Like, they love you so much. They trust you. They, they're going to help you. They, no questions asked. And uh, that was very, very hard for me. The second piece was the friends, right? Because I build so much relationships, right? Because when you play in professional sports and then you work and you got all the facets of your life filled out with different friends and different outlets, that was very tough decision for me to make this. And then the third part was I was thinking for my mom will not going to get off an interaction with the grandkids, right? That was the huge piece as well. But at the same time, I was thinking through, okay, I'm not doing that even for myself. It's going to be for generations to come because my kids will be in a better opportunity for to get great education, right? To play sports because we were playing sports. We would love them. My, my kids are playing sports right now, all of them. So, and I was thinking through the future more than just even the present, but it all turned out quite amazing because you know the the quality of living and then the opportunities right in the united states and uh the business opportunities and in, in, on that you know on that aspect was a huge right and they turned out to be really real successful decision though has that the success that you've had here have you been able to translate that and help family and friends back home like what does that look like and because i know that's a lot of people's motivations not only taking care of your future generations but you know what you left behind making sure they're better off absolutely yeah so one of the there's a lot of different stories but then one of the probably most important things my sister she was employee and she's employee until today and uh i was talking about we opened the business right and we're doing such sure things blah 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 and then I was doing the uh, investments, right? Real estate investments. She was watching me from 2013, how I'm buying different properties, converting them, putting the people there, talking to her about that. And she got inspired to the point. And uh, a couple of years ago, she bought three units. She went out and bought three different units, apartment units, and she renovated them. It was not easy. It was very, very tough, right? But she renovated them. She was paying mortgage actually for all three. And she was complaining for about a year because it was, you know, such the capital impactful for her event. And then all of a sudden she fixed one, she fixed another one. And maybe like a couple of months ago, she said, you know what? I found a way she fixed the third one without even capital. I just put the contractors to leave there and they said they're going to fix that place. Anyway, she found the way through the challenges to own that real estate and to make that asset very, very valuable for people to live there. So, and then I, I'm just, you know, beyond excited. So I was able to influence. And then from employee mindset, she turned into investor mindset, number one, she started to invest in different, you know, equity markets. That was the first step. And then from that step, she said, I'm going to take it to the real estate side as well. And she bought those three units. And now she's a real estate investor now. She actually bought five of them, but two of them was sold recently. Congrats to her. Yeah. And that's, again, for me, that's the best feedback I can get from people, right? When I see the change, like a real change, not just the talking, because some people, they will talk about that. They will never and ever will take that action, which is sad. And then she was listening and then she was quiet and taking little baby steps. And all of a sudden she owns that thing, right? Yeah. 
that's definitely a great reason to start your own journey and take the risk be like be the black sheep i know for me i invested into my first syndication of 108 apartments in 2021 almost three years ago now and then you know within the last year once my friends and family started seeing it happen more regularly and they finally got comfortable with it now i've gotten them into investing into some of our opportunities also and and again maybe you can feel it as well but this is the most beneficial feeling so when you actually see that transformation right of the people from one stage to another saying you know what that was scary i couldn't do that in the beginning so there were so many obstacles right and all of a sudden it's all clear i know what to do right it's not scary anymore i took that risk i'm still alive so nothing's going to happen with me i'll do it one more time exactly so once you moved here and you, you know, left the world you knew behind family and friends and everyone, I guess it's kind of like a part two. Walk us through that, yeah. where you've been here, your real estate journey here in the U.S. and what that's looked like. Uh, yeah. So uh, once we moved on, the, probably in three months, we got a green card as a, because we played sports on a high level. So we were extraordinary green cards very very fast and very is quick that and then we the a one visa or something different uh it's not the visa oh, it's, it's a green card it's the eb1 or is it a different i think so yes that's okay. it uh i don't know it's probably called extraordinary green card i'm yeah. not sure about eb1 numbers so but uh back then in 2009 was 2010 it was 2010 we came in 2009, November. We apply maybe about in March of, or maybe April. Oh, sorry, uh, March, February. But it was very um, tough. Why? Because the internet was not huge as well. And they asked us to prove a lot of different things. And the fun, fun fact is there's only two United States water polo players ever in the history played in Russia. And I happened to be with them in the same team. So one of them, and they both live in California, and they both live in LA. So one of them is a UCLA head coach for water polo, Adam Wright, and the other one is a commercial broker right now. He lives in Long Beach, which is very close to where I'm at. And when the USCIS requested us, if you guys claim you're famous, uh, who knows you from United States? There's There's got to be people who knows you from United States. Can you give us letters of referral or letters of recommendation from United States citizen to you. And I was like, oh my God, I have no idea. Like, I don't know anybody. And then I was like, oh my God, I played with two guys. They are amazing, right? And we spent a lot of time with them. We were talking, I was showing around and helping them as much as I can to acclimate, to accommodate to Russian culture. And I reach out to them and, and they say, oh, of course. So they call me like Gary back then and say, oh yeah, of course. You just show up to the pool, we'll do this. And they gave me the, the, the letter of recommendation. And my wife actually, because of the cycle of WNBA girls, they were always playing in Russia or in Europe. So they will play uh, WNBA season, right? Which is probably about um, June through September. And they fly to Europe. They'll take a couple min, a couple months break, and they will fly to Europe to earn some money, right? And that was the cycle of them living. So uh, a lot of like a super Diana Taurasi and uh, Lisa Leslie, and it's one of the top players back then. So actually, Taurasi right now at the Olympic Games. So one of the top players. They were all playing in Russia. So and because my wife played in the same team with them, we asked for a referral as well from them. So and we got that letter, and then we received the green cards immediately. The green cards. Why I'm saying that green cards allowed us to open the business and to start the business like officially. So we had the social security number. We got green cards. Like in two months after the green cards, we opened the business. And that was the basketball academy for kids. So we started to really teach and coach kids, right? And because of the background professional background we knew exactly what it takes to become very very successful in sports so people start to recognize it oh you know they know exactly what what it takes they know what they do and so we know the we like the approach because the difference was we were bringing the euro style uh, coaching and focus right and practice into american 
you know, world, I would say market, then people are like, oh, nobody's doing that. We really like that. And people start to talk about, we opened one, two, three, four, five different locations. So business started to grow. That was my second personal development from the employee mindset. I became like a business, I would say business first and then business owner mindset. And then I became the business management and scaling mindset because all of those developments of business Part of it will give you a lot of different opportunities to grow internally, right? I'm talking about discipline. I'm talking about the ability to resist because there's a lot of challenges with business, like running the business. There's so many challenges, right? There's ups and downs every single day, I would say, maybe every single week. The biggest challenges, the, you know, the fun times and all of that the managing people, right? The leading people, the developing people internally in your company. So that was my second and huge piece of internal development on the side of my uh, real estate investment was a little bit on the side. I was more focused on the business and growing and scaling business, investing a little bit. And then that time, so I feel like it's, it's I don't know, explode my mindset. It just explode my even investment ability because I start to think different. I'm going to stop here, Kishan. <laughs> no, you're good. I think that makes sense. So where are we now chronologically? Like what year? So and where are we now? Uh -huh. I meant what year are uh, we in your story now? Yeah. So uh, having the business and I would say running the business, managing the business, leading the business, very, very tough thing. So it's a, it's a very consuming thing. So you might be consumed 24-7 into your business. Because again, the difference between employee and the business owner, right? The employee will just check out at 4, 5 p.m., 6 p.m., whatever the time is. I'll never think about his work. And that's the reality, 90% of the people, right? Maybe it's different for somebody, but that's what my experience is. And then for business owner, you might check out from the clock, but your mind is still spinning. And in my mind, it was, listen, I can't work like that with that same output of my personal energy into the business when I'm going to be 60 or 70 years old. There's no way in the world, right? There's no way you can be as productive as you young, right? At 25, 30, 35. And for myself was, listen, I got to build something which is passive cash flow, and it's going to be as supportive as my business ca active cash flow, right? And I said, meanwhile, I'm so active and productive in my business, and I'm still young. I'm going to set aside that second street, stream of income, sorry, and I'm going to start to invest, double down on that real estate idea, and start to invest more and more. And that time, I started to talk to my wife. I said, listen. Uh, from single family and from you know apartment units, we need to scale that. If we if we want to think about like a like real scale, like you're talking about like millions of dollars, like a tens of hundred millions of dollars, you're not going to be able to do it fast in a single family right space, or you need to very like a large capital to do that right right away. So, and we said where we can invest our money because we didn't have like, we didn't have like a tens of millions of dollars to place the capital right away and buy apartment complex. And that, that time I started to ask my mentors on the business and I said, listen, you guys, I don't see you own single family houses. What do you guys do? So I don't see you guys own multiple apartment units. You own something else. And they start saying, oh, of course, we own an apartment complex. We own one roof with a multiple units in the same place. I said, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Why? And they said, because it's a one management company. It's professional people. They will show up. They will fix in one day all the issues, right? They will monitor, right? They will, you know, uh, will be responsible for um, vacant units. They will put the people in place and stuff like that. I was like, wow, that makes a lot of sense. So you start to scale under one roof with a lot of families mm -hmm. and with all of that safety of different employments, right? Because those people who live in that one, you know, apartment complex, they employ by different employers, right? What are the chances all of them are going to go bankrupt or broke or just, you know, 
fire all the people right from work and it started to make sense because again i experienced when you own like a single family for example home and somebody leaving from your home and that leverage in russia it was all cash i never leveraged anything right in the united states i started to leverage because i want to scale that business right i want to buy 10 of them i don't want to buy one in cash and then receive three percent especially in california and wait for that appreciation for next two to three to five years right because it's risky it's scary right what if the market turns the other way and you're still receiving two percent right on your money so what i was thinking about i was like listen let me leverage let me start to play smart game let me start to leverage and use the bank money because especially it's so favorable in the united states right as well to get the leverage against your real estate and uh, like i said when the people leave right then you start the process of you know new tenants and searching them and doing the stuff it goes by by two months and all of your profits are eaten by payments for your mortgage i was like wow that's incredible so and then the other like Anyways, I start to really understand if you're in an apartment complex and you own a hundred units, right? And then 10 people left and that's fine. So you still get enough of cash flow and cushion, right? To be operational and to be sufficient and it's still cash flow. And then um, I start to really think through a larger scale and through the multifamily. And we start to go deeper and deeper into the syndications. Cool. And kind of tell us, where you are today at a high level, whether it's like what you're involved mm -hmm. in, you like, what are your responsibilities? And then, you know, how many apartments do you guys like, are you guys invested in, you know, or, or even other asset classes? Yeah. So right now we're in the 22 projects so far. Um, the idea was again, because the creation of the fund came through. So how we diversify across different things what are the things we said okay how we get management risk so we want to engage with different companies like we don't want to invest with one company right we want to invest with one company second third fourth because management piece is very important that's what we believe in we said if this manager is not you know performing really well so we can test it either with different asset class as well so that's the second diversification we said, if we find one operator who is doing really good job on RV parks, right? Or maybe mobile home parks. So we want that person to be hyper-focused on one asset class and doing just one asset class. And then if we want apartment complexes, we want to find that operator who's doing really, really good at just the one space an apartment complex in a certain area, for example, let's say in Texas, right? And then we want to focus on that guy and see how he's performing. And then lastly, we said, okay, the location wise, if everybody wants to go to Florida and everybody went to Florida, probably we don't want to be there. Why? Because it's just so noisy. Everybody's doing that. So we want to find different states, more quiet when market is not going up and down so fast, right? So those are the three pieces. Again, we said the management risk the location and the asset class. And th this is the focus, the core focus of the fund that's what we chosen to do. And from there we said, okay, let's go and test. And we test a different, for example, in the multifamily specifically, if we talk about asset class, we said, okay, can we do the ground up developments? So we tried two of those projects. We said the one is not an indication. We tried two of those projects. Both of these projects are not perform really well. Again. There's a better turn always. They promise you, I don't know, 3X in your money in three years. Let's say, let's put it this way. So both of these projects for us was not successful. I'm not saying it's it's a bad investment, but at the same time, I understand there's a time delay. There's always construction problems. There's always a, a double of the budget, so which is nobody's talking about in the beginning. And uh, we said, listen, we... We, we understand that, we love that model. This model is not for us. We wanna be more safe. Okay, we tested the other model, right? Inside of multifamily, we said, okay, well, let's do like a simple value add, right? Um, let's probably like 80s, 90s vintage, a little bit older. Let's see how that works. We found uh, five different operators in that space who hyper-focused right on vintage and then on certain uh, states and we, place the capital there so 
all of these projects were successful was the one important thing. We were always going into the fixed rate debt. That this is very important. I want to pause here. So we were always choosing the projects with fixed debt. Why? Because we said if if that makes sense at the fixed rate, whatever rate, it's, it could be 20%, but it makes sense, right, on that rate. And there is no adjusting rate. There is no X factors, right, in the future. We can always trust the numbers. We can always trust that market and place the capital there. So what I'm saying is those are the projects where they perform a lot better than others. I'm saying so the fixed rate, a little bit or the vintage. There's a lot of things you can add. They can add a lot of value in those things. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll spot those out a little bit more. So we tested the other uh, project, which was uh, the storage facilities. And they perform really, really well because, again, I didn't know that as well as much. Uh, people do really love to store their things more than anything in the world. So I don't know why, but in the United States, that's the nature of the people. They buy a lot of things. They consume a lot of things. A lot of things they don't need, they buy. And then they storm the storage. They will never move out from that storage. They always, you know, it's it's a challenging for them to just say, listen, today's Saturday, I'm going to go move from one storage to another storage and then lower my payment by $20, right? So those those uh, really good projects for us, it's been performed really, really well. The storage facilities, win a couple of them. <clears throat> and uh, the other asset class we really, really like as well, we uh, did a land entitlement. I don't know if you're familiar with that uh, business model. And the reason why we did that, because when the multifamily start to encounter those, you know, interest rate problems and uh, products are starting to go um, not the direction we would love them to go, we said, listen, we want to mitigate that risk. I'm talking about the bank uh, leverage and uh, financing right, and stuff. So we said, let's do the project, which is going to be full equity. And we did the full equity play with that land entitlement. There's no bank involved. And then we're not doing any type of construction. It's just really the paper play. And uh, that was uh, super successful as well. And I think I'm going to stop here. So that's that's enough for now. So that's those are the ones we explore. Oh, the last one. I want to mention the last one before. Uh, we did the private, again, because of multifamily, and we said, and unless we really, really trust the multifamily project itself, right, on a, on the project level, so we see a really good number. So we start to see a deep discounts because people start to realize they cannot pay for, you know, for that they acquire. We really said, can we become a land? Can we lend the money to those? Can we, can we just capture that opportunity on the market with multifamily downside and? So what we're doing right now, it's a private credit fund to commercial real estate. We'll land the breach loan, mezzanine loan under equity financing to those projects who's like encounter. They still have a good cash flow, but they encounter certain problems. For example, they go out on the market, they want to refi. So then we can provide for them capital. So that's the last thing I'm going to mention. That's it. I'm going to stop here. <laughs> okay. And you know, your journey here from you know where you started. 12 years old when you first learned someone you could pay you to live in a house and or an apartment and where you are now what are like a few of the biggest roadblocks or failures that you've encountered and how did you get past them um i think the biggest uh the biggest enemy, enemy, sorry, it's uh, yourself. And I'm still, you know, I'm still fearful every single day, right? But then being able to step into that fear and work with that. I was going to Tony Robbins event in, I think, 2019, 2020. And he gave me a great quote. I still live with that quote every day. Learn to dance with your fear, like not to hide, not to, you know, maybe you fight that all the time, but really learn to dance with that. What I'm saying is here, I'm talking about myself right now, every single day you might encounter certain challenges. And then again, the fear what pops up first, right? The fear of you name it, I don't know. So there's different ones, right? I think five basic fears and learn to dance with that. What does that mean? It's learn to work with it. 
right? I don't know how, but again, if you're going to learn to work with that, because every, what I'm saying, I know how, because every journey is different, right? And there's no advice here, but again, learning for me, for me personally, learning to dance with my fears, that was a huge piece. Staying in my scent, my scent, my mindset of discipline. For example, you wake up in the morning, I do follow certain routines, right? I wake up usually early than I want to, early when I need to. Why? Because I want a time for myself. I want a space, right, for my head. I want my mind, my thinking, right? I want my plans first. I want to plan my day in the future, right? A little bit, my week in the future. So again, thinking time is huge, huge piece for me. The meditation is a huge piece as well because once you start your work day, and again, that I'm talking for myself, when I, once I start my work day, there's so many things you need to do. There's so many, there's no even time to think. Like you just execute, execute, execute. And the only time when you can really structurally and deeply understand what you're doing and where you're going, it's a morning time for me. So that's early morning before your family wakes up, before the employees wakes up, right? And you start to work and things, you know, this is a super powerful time for me. So I think the discipline and the mindset was huge. And I brought it from the sports because, because again, uh, in sports, it's all physical. But if you're talking about the high level performance and you're talking to any high achievers in sports, it's nothing to do with your body. Like there's like min very minute because every single body of the athlete is the same, same height, same muscle. Like, I mean, I'm talking about plus minus, right? But what separates the top from the bottom, it's a mindset. What are you actually talking to yourself? Like, what are you actually, what's this internal conversation, All right? And that discipline and the mindset and routine, being persistent, right? And again, I took a lot of things from sports that was a huge for my development. And I'm still developing, not saying I'm anywhere, like I'm still developing every single day. I still work out every well, probably every other day, not if, if not every single day. So, and I think that's a huge piece of my, uh, you know, come success as well and where I'm at right now. And so it sounds like planning your day and meditation are kind of two ways you dance with your peers. What are, what's like one or two more ways that you've found helpful to take on uncertainty or anything yeah, you know, that's not purely positive emotion. So you see one of the two ways I found for myself? Yeah, like just a few more ways. Like you mentioned planning, you mentioned meditation. Just like a few more ways that you found helpful. Uh, some other things like, uh, again, uh, so one of the, like being, um, so sometimes there's a fear in front of the big, big challenge. But again, when you piece it out and you have that discipline to work every single day, for example, you're like, oh, I can't do this. Like, why? Because it's for certain people or for certain this. And then you piece it out and you have that discipline to wake up every day and do that, take an action. Because again, action, yes, there's got to be planned, but the, the other balance of it, like you got to take an action. If you're not taking an action, remember that um, idea of my sister, she was like, digesting a lot of ideas and information but at the end of the day at one day she decided listen i'm going to take that action so i'm going to take i'm going to draw that because you know she she draw that favorable rate from the bank and she was able to finance those things because i was talking about the financing all the time right i was talking about leveraging the banks how we how the system works how the structures are working and and one of the things when you like when I'm so fearful in front of the big, big challenge, I was like, okay, let's take a small little tiny step. Let's not fear anymore, right? Let's actually can counter that with the action, right? And then that action will propel you to the bigger action. And then the the bigger action will get you to the first success. And now you get dopamine, you know, oh, I got it. I can do that. You know, let's push it. Let's move forward, right? And then that move forward piece, oh, people like start to recognize, it. oh, can I work with you? Can we partner? Can we do this? Can And then, you know, all of a sudden from big, big fear, you became like successful person. And that was my personal journey as well. So I took a little tiny action. I wasn't successful. Like, again, I had 
nothing in my bank account in the beginning, right? So I, I did play sports. Of course, I made money. But again, it was not a millions of dollars that you sign the WNBA NBA contract or it's like NFL contract, right? At the superstar level. So, but because I was persistent and taking action okay let me buy the one little property first right and after that one little property i said oh the cash flow is coming i would never actually use in the cash flow i was always setting this aside so my other rule was like never touch the cash flow from the investments so and it was like again just imagine it was like mounting every week every month every year right that was and i still never touch it right because i can leave off of the active things so and then uh the second idea was okay you take that action right that action will lead you to the new opportunities you educate yourself that's another probably way to work with fear you educate of the unknown right you start to deep into a lot of education so i'm still like learning every single day so the last one i was doing the Harvard university of like real estate investment and finance and i took a lot from that course again because i went to that and took an action i connect to new people right led me to new business opportunities what i'm saying is the action the balance and, and i think it, it helps you to really work through that fear and start to dance with that and finally you know become on that other side right of success yeah uh and so even when you take action sometimes obviously you're going to fail things aren't going to go your way right so what were some times in your life where things didn't go how you planned and then how did you yeah, that sounds like an interview question jeez Times like when, you know, you're along your investing journey, your business building journey where things didn't go as you planned. And then what actions did you take after that to move past it? What did you learn? Uh, yeah, so uh, like, <clears throat> and right, right again, every single day there's a challenge. When you run the business, active business, and the people say, oh, there's no challenges. And I'm really skeptical about those things because Every single day, there's challenges coming in, right? So one one of the attitudes I said, there's, do not expect it to be easy. Number one, I said, do not expect it to be those other challenges. Get the better tools to solve challenges. Equip yourself to, sell, to solve the challenges, right? Don't hide from that. So make sure, I mean, number one, it's going to happen. It's just a matter of time. But how you equip to solve it, that's just your personal responsibility right and again being the person of constant education and digesting all the new information right connecting to people and sharing experiences and learning experience of other people and failures that's huge uh and some some like a beginning challenges was like what somebody is not paying me like one time i was a guy he lived in my house and it was like he stopped paying me payments i was like oh my goodness and again i'm talking about california right? There's very, and he's with a family, it was a little kid. So I was like, I'm not going to be able to evict that person. He's going to live there a long time. So, and that was a huge fear, right? At the same time, I was like, man, but I got to find a way. And then I started, because I had the law degree, right? In Russia. So I said, okay, let me deep into the law and then read what lines of that law. And I, I learned, so I need to serve the notice to him. So I asked my employee actually to dress up as a, you know, as an official person, a black suit it was a tie. <laughs> Gave him an envelope and said, it's Daniel. His name was Daniel. Said, Daniel, you go there to my house, knock the door, like act like you have be a FBI agent, right? It was like a little little game of mental like things and you serve him notice. So that was one of the challenges again. So first of all, I got struck. I was like, what can I do? There's nothing I can do. I'm in the state with a blah, 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 the rules and stuff. So, but be, becoming creative, I was not crossing the legal line. So let's, let's serve it, but let's play a little bit of, you know, deeper game on psychology and then it really worked because the guy called me and said oh i'm ready to pay you and he actually back on track and he moved in a couple a couple months but again i i set the standard i said i'm not going to be able to support you right you're not going to leave there for free so this is what's going to happen we're going to take legal action immediately right and he understood he can't just take advantage of me so and again those are the learning lesson and from now on i said listen if i'm Taking that issue seriously, if I prepare it, right, it's going to be a lot easier for me to survive through that market, right, through the challenges. And, you know, I'm always acting <clears throat> from a legal standpoint, 
very serious on time know exactly what you do know exactly what your rights are so you can just take advantage of that so that was just a little challenge for me that's interesting got into reading the law and actually it actually worked in california which i feel like you don't hear that often how about the days where you're feeling down or you you know something didn't go yeah something didn't go the way you planned how do you pick yourself back up how do you stay consistent beyond great question telling yourself in your mind i have to stay consistent are there great systems you, systems you've put into place post-it notes you know something posters on the wall anything like that great question yeah, yeah. thank you thank you sean uh i think and and again, it's not secret. There are the days, there are some days you're like, oh my goodness, nothing works. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm doing and stuff like that. So again, what helps me every time when I feel it, it's just a system and routine. So I do really go back by default. A lot of times it happens when, when I do not wake up early enough, right? I do not do meditation. I do not work out, right? Because what I found for myself, super, super helpful as well, when I'm not in balance internally. So I go back by default to those systems. I wake up early. I go to bed early. I block out. I don't use social media as much, right? Because again, it's, 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 it's a very tough tool for me. I'm trying not to use I right now I'm watching Olympic games. This is the only connection with uh, I would say the entertainment world for me. But again, I'm I'm getting I'm getting hammered when it's advertising after advertising after advertising. I cannot watch those things. I cannot listen when somebody is pitching me something like it. it's it's it gives me anxiety right away. But again, at the same time, what I'm saying is I'm just going back to routines. I wake up early. I work out, visualizations, writing down the things, very important for me as well. I'm just, what I'm saying is it's it's not my idea, right? I'm going to Miracle Morning routine, if you guys ever heard that. So I would definitely recommend you guys checking out Miracle Morning. That's the guy who created the system, which is called Savers. So every single, right, it stands for the word, every single capital right right if you uh name the word saviors right it's going to be silence which is again meditation and affirmation which is going to stand for a and stuff like that so, so miracle morning savers so i go by default to that system and it just brings me back on track right away so i don't need to stick out of anything i just finish one two three early morning you feel fresh energized focus because of that time was yourself you like i need to work you identify very important things you need to work on right now so because a fresh mind early morning nobody disturbing you you're like oh, i do focus on this and then when the day comes and he's like oh then something's not working you're like oh remember in the morning when it was quiet you set the specific goal to work on something go to that thing and do that so that what's like again that that's my default system to come back on track and just you know, it's been working for me really, really well. Great stuff. Miracle morning routine. Yeah. What would you say your long-term goals are? Is there, do you want to grow the fund to a certain size? Do you want to have a certain number of investors, certain number of units? What are you aiming for? Yeah. yeah I'm not a fan of kind of counting units for sure. So we we say it like that. So if we can help more people to get to that, because I feel like there's a mental state. And again, that's my personal experience, not talking about anybody right now. So there's certain fears in the beginning stage of trust the investment. And some of the examples like these, like, again, I will take the extreme, right? The Bitcoin, for example, like, Talk to Bitcoin six years ago to people. It's like, what are you talking about? What type was a digital money? So it's a type of scam. Like now you're talking to people, oh, I do own this thing. You're like, wow, from like it's only it took them six years for from absolutely distrust and you know, fraud 
and the idea of like a scam to, oh, I do own this thing. So the same in the syndication and the real estate right world as well. The people who is usually employed and they own a stock brokerage account, maybe they have a financial advisor as well. So it's very, very hard to get into the world alternative private placement and investments because it does looks like not legit investment. It's a scam. It's not working because there's so much noise in the world. And for us, if we can convert another thousand people into the people who trust the real estate and syndication right world, and they start to really see the benefits, right? And they start to pass it on to their kids and the families and the friends. That's going to be a huge goal again, because it's for me, it's a mental shift. Right from saying, I don't trust the system, I don't know, people, the real estate, the idea, to, oh, I trust it, uh, I'm willing to take a risk, you know, I'm fine, you know, if I lose the money, I'm fine. Because first of all, you need to say to yourself, and I feel like it's a process of education, I lose the money, that's fine. Because, you know, there's something embedded into our brain saying, okay, money and lost money, so and it's such as the drastic event in your emotional level in your brain so people saying oh what if i lose the money that's fine you lose the money that's fine what if you're never going to invest what's going to happen then just think about that what are you going to lose then you're going to lose all of it right you're not going to lose just a hundred thousand dollars you're going to lose all of the life of investor and being connected to people on different level right and thinking about different goals into the future right or being able to pay for your child education which is going to propel that you know generation to the absolutely incredible levels and stuff like that so what i'm saying if we get the next thousand of people and say listen so from this place of safety employment and being in the you know cubicle from nine to five nine to whatever so you can get to the place of opportunity next level what's going to be the next generation so uh, I think that's huge for me. And then I get the goosebumps when we convert the people from this to that. That was, that, that's our goal. That's great to hear, man. Okay. Well, let's see. Like those are the big things that I had. So Igor, thank you for joining us today on investing for generational wealth. Uh, to learn more about discipline and determination and just investing in general and business and real estate, reach out to Igor. Uh, Igor's email is igor at avistafund.com. And the website is also avistafund.com. We'll include the links in the description wherever you're watching or listening to this. Thanks again, Igor, for coming on to educate us about your exciting journey from apartments in Russia now to apartments and land and self-storage and more here in the U.S. For those of you listening at home, don't forget to like and subscribe to our podcast and whichever platform you're listening to, to make sure that we can continue bringing you the best educational content. Thanks, everyone. And until next time, keep learning for generational wealth. I'm not going